I'm going to be talking about uh, testing for metastatic breast cancer, which is such an important topic. And I really have my patients and the patient community to thank for my uh, interest and ability to communicate about this, thing, uh, about this topic. I learn so much from my patients, their questions, uh, their concerns, their history, the way they tell their history, the way they describe their symptoms. Uh, all, of, uh, all of those things really help us as physicians be better communicators. And that is uh, uh, really a two-way street. So uh, in that vein and in that spirit, I, I want to share with you some of the latest uh, technologies and also some of the things that we've been doing for many years to evaluate patients with metastatic breast cancer. The field is changing so quickly that this lecture probably could be given uh, several times a year. Uh, and I will uh, focus uh, not only on the new, but uh, the established uh, technologies as well, and how to interpret these results, which of course is critically important. So you have in my title slide, I try to be economic and put as much information uh, on, on the title slides, you have depictions of different types of assays that I'm going to go into uh, in more detail that give us multi-dimensional looks at the uh, tumor uh, the proteins and the genetics that not only dictate their behavior, uh, but more importantly, help us find the best treatment strategy. We've known that breast cancer is really a collection of many different genetic diseases for many years. This slide up here is one of the main representations of the Cancer Genome Atlas, a uh, very ambitious a uh, project that went on for several decades to sequence many different tumors. These were all tumors for patients that were newly diagnosed, so they didn't really give us a look at metastatic cancer, which is a little bit different. But what they showed us uh, that's diagrammed in this picture, and I won't go into the details of it, but uh, that uh, no cancer is the same. When you look at the genes that are mutated and the genes that are amplified, which are depicted across uh, the uh, horizontal side of this um, slide, uh, and the, the different um, colors on the left bar indicate the different receptor subtypes, horm hormone receptor positive, HER2 negative, HER2 positive, triple negative, and so on. And you can see that the uh, small gray bars rep representing different genetic mutations are very different among the different subtypes. So no two cancer is the same. All of these mutations uh, contribute in one way or another to the development of cancer and also to the biologic behavior of the cancer, such as the propensity to metastasize, and in some cases, even what drugs might be successful. So the key thing is to decode that information, to understand what these genes do and how to measure them and, and analyze them in individuals. So this was the first step in us understanding the, the personalized behavior of every person's cancer and maybe the secrets behind treatment. Now this is a depiction of another big challenge that we have in, in cancer development and cancer progression and the development of drug resistance, and this is evolution of cancer. What you see here is a depiction of uh, a cancer cell mass and each different color uh, that shades the, the circles are different genetic makeups of uh, a particular cancer. So when someone is told they have a HER2 positive cancer, every cell actually is not HER2 positive. Uh, as you heard from Jamil, the, there's a billion cells in about one centimeter of tumor. And you can imagine that there is diversity in tumor cells just like there is diversity in the bacteria in your body and there's diversity of human beings on our planet. A tumor is not a carbon copy of one cell uh, uh, after another. There's already some variation. So when you apply a therapy, uh, you may be selecting for a subset, and over time you actually get tumoral evolution, which is depicted on the right side of the diagram. And uh, when you expose uh, a patient to therapy, or when the tumor is just selecting not against a drug, but against a property, for example, the ability to metastasize, the ability to leave its original spot in the breast and actually travel, that's an inefficient process. Most cancer cells cannot metastasize, but one of them may have the ability to do that, and then that cell divides, and now that colony that has metastasized is actually different from the original site. So a part of uh, testing that we do takes into account that things are changing over time, and you'll hear me say that sometimes repeat testing is important. 
And then we have the technology that allows us to do um, much, much of this work. And I'm going to get into the specifics of testing, but I wanted to make some of these general comments first. We, we now have the ability to take a very small piece of tissue and amplify its DNA and look at its RNA and also to look at proteins through immunohistochemical staining to give us uh, different dimensions of the tumor that affect, affect its behavior. Uh, so the technology that allows us to do that is important. But what's really, really important is for us to know what to do with that information. And this is what requires large trials. It requires patients who have volunteered over the years to uh, have that some of their tumors subjected uh, to research, to gene sequencing back before we knew what to do with the information. These were patients that were giving of themselves for no direct benefit but to contribute to research. And after years of doing that and being able to follow how these patients did over time, what, uh, what areas did their tumors travel to, to what drugs did they respond, to what drugs did they not respond, we've been able to put together uh, an encyclopedia, so to speak, of what these genetic aberrations mean. Uh, because without that information, we couldn't really apply this uh, information to make personalized decisions. So you've got a, a depiction here of uh, some of the technology that has allowed us to do this. Uh, one of the biggest ones is us, our ability to amplify the genome and to sequence it rapidly. Uh, the, the Human Genome Project that started in the 90s uh, took forever to get completed, but the last part of it was done really quickly because of the development of next generation sequencing, which is really cool technology. And basically what it does is it takes the DNA, which of course is billions of base pairs uh, for any individual, and chops it up into little pieces. And then it adds base pairs that are colored with different dyes. And then uh, the DNA is analyzed very quickly with a color colorimetric analyzer. And the computer information that we have now with rapid computing technology allows um, a, a software to then tile these colored pieces of DNA to actually assemble them in their real sequence. And very quickly, you get the whole sequence of a piece of DNA. Within, you can sequence an entire genome now within a day, uh, which would have been unheard of uh, years ago. So. Um, why, uh, how, and uh, why do we test breast cancer? Uh, I'm going to have to turn my, my view because I can't really read the, uh, the monitor here. So um, the uh, test of estrogen receptor, and I have a few of these listed here as, a, as an example, just as a primer as we go forward. Uh, the estrogen receptor, for example, is a protein, and that tells us whether a cancer cell will, will respond to hormonal therapy, and I think most of you uh, know that. Uh, the um, HER2 receptor is a growth factor that happens to be amplified in about 20% of the cases, and we can test that either by looking at the protein directly on a microscope slide that is stained, and when we say stained, we're usually talking about an antibody that recognizes HER2 that, that is colored with a specific color so the pathologist can read what percentage of the cells are HER2 positive. And not only that, they can say how intensely it is staining on a scale of zero to three, and they can also uh, say um, what percentage of the cells are staining, and based on se several criteria, we will determine that the tumor is HER2 positive or not. A PDL1 is a protein that measures the ability of the cancer cell to respond to um, the immune environment. Uh, as, as you may know, um, and actually it's amazingly, it's very surprising that our body can mount an immune response against cancer, and usually does. Uh, our immune system can recognize things like bacteria and viruses as foreign bodies and fight them by turning on uh, special immune cells that produce antibodies, these are known as B cells, and also by activating T cells, which directly kill cells by contact. And once the invader is gone and the infection is treated, the immune system withdraws so that it doesn't cause collateral damage, which is damage to normal tissue due to inflammation. You all probably know when you get the virus, you get the fevers and chills, that's when the virus is multiplying. And then once the infection is treated by your immune system, that's when you actually feel crummy is because of the inflammation, the cough and the phlegm. So uh, our, our body is able to do this. Cancer cells are also foreign. They are not normal, but they're very similar to your normal tissue because they came from your own cells. 
So the immune system has a harder time recognizing that, but it does. In fact, people are developing cancer every day, and then the immune system wipes out those very early signs, and the, the individual never even knows it, but their immune system has worked. And people that have defective immune systems um, actually do have a higher risk of certain cancers. So by the time a cancer develops, it has already been able to overcome the immune system in certain ways that uh, we have discovered over the, over the last few years that has allowed us to develop drugs to turn that around. And one of those is a protein called PDL1, which basically turns the immune system off as though the immune system was withdrawing. And cancer cells are very clever. They adapt to things, and they're not really clever. What it is that one cancer cell out of a billion just happens to have a low PDL1, and guess what? That cancer cell is going to be the one that continues to grow. So when we find that PDL1 is actually expressed, that tells us this is an opportunity to use immunotherapy. Um, let me see if uh, the, the um, the other uh, important thing we test, and I'm going to go, go into these in, in more detail, is the germline DNA. Now, the germline DNA is the DNA that we all uh, carry, that we propagate to our offspring. So in the, the gonads of the male and in the uh, ovary and the eggs of the female, uh, there is um, a, a, a line of DNA that is propagated to individuals that tell us and give us the instructions of life, one copy from uh, the father and one from the mother. Defects that um, are seen in DNA are quite common. All of us are born with changes in our DNA. Some of them are normal variations that give us the like, different colors of our eyes, but some of them are actually mutations that are not supposed to be there and can pass on diseases like sickle cell disease. Some of them can actually involve uh, genes that are important in protecting us from developing cancer, like repairing our DNA when a mutation develops. When our cells are dividing, they, they can sometimes make mistakes in the DNA, and those mistakes are propagated in all the cells that develop afterwards. So you would think we get mutations all the time, um, and we do. Uh, but usually a mutation leads to the death of the cell because it's in a critical area that affects cell metabolism or something else. But every now and then, very rarely, it happens to be in a growth factor or something that actually triggers the cell to grow. Just think about um, a car being in, a, uh, in an accident or uh, being jumbled around. Most of the things are going to make the car stop. But every now and then, something may uh, involve the accelerator and make the car go more quickly. So these are rare mutations, but they're critical. They get the cell going in the wrong direction, not able to respond to the stop signals and grow in an uncontrolled fashion. And so when that happens, um, uh, you, um, uh, you can get the development of cancer. And one of the things that can also go wrong is that the cell cannot repair these mutations. We have a very elaborate system of repairing mutations when they happen. Uh, there's an enzyme that senses where the DNA is broken. There's another one that comes in and changes the base pair. And there's another one that actually proofreads it. It's amazing the DNA repair machinery that are in all of uh, us, but also in yeast and in uh, lower forms of uh, life. I should say lower forms, but more pr primitive forms. Uh, so this is something that's been around for a long time. And when you have a mutation in that gene, that does not allow you to repair your DNA sufficiently or quickly enough, and that can lead to cancer as well. So that's something that we test for. You're familiar with genes like BRCA1 and BRCA2 and other not so common ones like PALB2. These are all involved in DNA repair. And we used to test them. They, these were first discovered in the early 90s when we knew that breast cancer and ovarian and many other cancers ran in families but had no idea what genes drove them. And, and when gene technology, sequencing technology got well uh, advanced enough for us to do this, uh, look, search the entire genome, we, we were able to find these genes and understand how they work biologically. And, and initially, it was just a diagnosis. You could tell someone they had an elevated risk of breast cancer because they have a BRCA2 mutation when you look at their family history, and they would have enhanced surveillance. So that was helpful, of course. But now, we actually know how these cancer cells are biologically different and what they're vulnerable to. And now we have drugs like PARP inhibitors. So that's a very important part of um, the biomarker analysis of patients with metastatic breast cancer. Uh, and then there are other mutations that give um, uh, cells uh, a growth advantage as well that also can lead to us pointing to a drug. 
And then there's RNA expression profiles. These are looking at the RNA where you can look at how multiple genes are expressed. Right now, these are used mostly in early stage breast cancer to give us information about the behavior of the cancer cell that we can't get through other tests. You've probably heard of Oncotype DX, which is used in early stage breast cancer. But we're increasingly developing these signatures to be used in advanced breast cancer to tell us which uh, drugs might be best. So that's an overview of the different um, a test that we do. So let me now step back a little bit and, and just go over what the general recommendations are for uh, testing uh, patients with metastatic breast cancer. Uh, not all of these are tissue testing. Of course, you're familiar with the fact that we know where the cancer is and what organs it's involving, and we do that with imaging tests um, that are, by the way, also becoming increasingly more sophisticated. CT scan of the chest, abdomen, pelvis, and a whole body bone scan are the most common ones that we use, but we also use PET CT scan, which allows us to look not only at the tumor size, but the metabolic activity, which of course is higher in cancer cells. Uh, the other uh, important part of um, testing someone who is newly diagnosed with metastatic breast cancer is to have them undergo genetic testing and germline DNA testing. We used to only reserve this for people with strong family histories, but now we recommend that everybody with metastatic breast cancer be tested because of some of the newer drugs uh, like PARP inhibitors, Olaparib uh, and Talazoparib uh, that um, uh, are used and can be helpful in patients that have BRCA1 and 2 uh, mutations. And over time, we're going to develop more drugs for people that have some of the other mutations. Uh, just recently, PARP1 inhibition seems to be better than Olaparib and talazoparib, uh, also, also known as linparza and um, talanza. And so uh, the, uh, this field is going to continue to evolve, mostly because of our greater understanding of these lesions and people participating in trials. Uh, the other thing that we always do when someone is um, diagnosed is we biopsy the tumor. And sometimes even when they already have metastatic cancer and the tumor is progressing, we may biopsy it because over time, uh, the biomarkers may change. Remember that evolution slide I showed you. If you're treating a HER2 positive cancer with uh, a drug like Herceptin, uh, there may be a few HER2 negative cells that aren't uh, sensitive to that, and they may grow up, and then uh, the next metastasis might actually be a, a clonal selection of those HER2 negative tests, and that can actually influence therapy. And I've actually been talking to several people who uh, have experienced that, and that's why it's important to retest. And then uh, we also get next generation sequencing, which um, you all uh, are also becoming familiar with, uh, which is um, uh, looking at mutations in the tumor itself. This is different than germline testing because the tumor itself has acquired many new mutations that your original DNA did not have, and those can actually spell certain aspects of the behavior of the cancer and help us um, identify who should uh, be treated with what drug. So I'll go over uh, the details of some of the com more common mutations that we find in the tumor DNA that can point us in the right direction. So uh, the first um, uh, set of tests we do uh, uh, are the uh, biomarkers for the receptors. That, that drives a lot of the primary treatment. When someone has a new metastasis or maybe progression, we check for estrogen receptor itself to see if they may be a candidate for endocrine therapies. About two-thirds of all breast cancer cases are hormone receptor positive. And um, as initial treatment, we usually use some form of endocrine therapy that interrupts the ability of estrogen to bind to the estrogen receptor and stimulate growth. The estrogen receptor is a growth factor of sorts. And uh, different levels of the estrogen receptor can be seen and might point to whether or not uh, patients can be a candidate for these therapies. The, uh, we grade it by how intense it is staining. And the more intense staining we see, the more likely it is to respond to endocrine therapies. And we still are developing many new endocrine therapies. It remains a very important part of our treatment armamentarium. We're finding stronger drugs like Protax and CERNs. I won't go into that. Uh, as much in detail, but only to tell you that it is still an important target. And not only that, we're hoping that we can use these types of treatments longer and longer uh, because we know at some point people become resistant to endocrine therapies, uh, but some people respond to them for, for years and decades even. 
And we want to understand why they respond, but we also want to make more options that where we can still target the estrogen receptor, even though they may develop resistance to uh, the first line treatment like aromatase inhibitors or tamoxifen. Uh, so I won't go into those details um, since we don't really have time to talk about them, but it underscores the importance of testing for estrogen receptor. And this is just a, a diagram as to how the different therapies uh, work. One of them is simply to remove the source of estrogen, and, and you've heard of people having ovarian suppression uh, to, to do that. Or uh, androgens that get converted to estrogens, which is the source of estrogen in postmenopausal patients, uh, where there's still estrogen around, and we use aromatase inhibitors for that. And again, I won't go into as much detail into um, the biology of how we treat patients other than to say it is critical to know that status. Estrogen receptor can be overcome by growth factor signaling. That's one of the main mechanisms of resistance to endocrine therapy. But signaling through growth factors is also um, a driver of cancer as well. Growth factors are proteins that tell cells when to grow and when to stop growing. And of course, they're necessary for us to develop properly. Uh, many mutations that uh, lead to cancer are mutations where these growth factors are dysregulated. So that's an important part of us knowing what is um, uh, driving someone's cancer. For example, PI3 kinase is a very important signaling pathway that's actually depicted on this slide. And mutations in one of the parts of that protein, it's a multi-proteins uh, multi that come together for one enzyme, can lead to overgrowth. And uh, targeting that mutation, one that's known as PI3 kinase, can actually uh, help uh, uh, and is used as a treatment. Hormonal therapy is increasingly being made more effective by drugs that partner with hormonal therapy to augment their effect, like cyclin-dependent kinase inhibitors and PI3 kinase inhibitors. And that's why it's important for us to understand that part of the pathway. And this shows you how complex that pathway is and how it can be targeted by certain drugs like PI3 kinase inhibitors. And don't worry really about the details of these diagrams because they're, they're more there to show you the conceptual path, uh, fact that um, these growth uh, pathways each can have aberrations that we want to know about because some of the drugs we use can then be used uh, to, 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 uh, to uh, uh, treat them. And, um, we, this is one example of a drug uh, called alpelacib that makes a small difference in how patients do if they have a PI3 kinase mutation. And this led to the approval of this drug. And now there are some newer drugs that, um, that also work and may actually work uh, better uh, against PI3 kinase. And, and we're going to need to do these trials where we know the mutational status of PI3 kinase and we test patients with drugs that inhibit that pathway that I showed you earlier. Uh, this is an example of one of those newer drugs called capovacertib, which is, was just recently approved uh, back in December and shows an improvement in patients who have genetic abnormalities in that pathway, again, underscoring the need to test that pathway. HER2 testing is quite complicated, and this uh, diagram shows you how we look at not only the intensity of the staining, but whether or not the gene is present in many copies. One of the ways that HER2 uh, exhibits a high level is either through a mutation, but more commonly simply because the gene is, has multiple copies and um, uh, results in the uh, more production of HER2 growth factor, which then stimulates growth. And so we actually test both the protein and amplification of the gene, and the pathologist has to take both of those into account to make the ultimate call, is this cell HER2 positive or not? So it's rather complicated, as you can see in that diagram. And you've, you may have heard about immunohistochemical testing that stains for the protein, and then FISH, fluorescence in situ hybridization, that tells you if the gene is present in multiple copies, which is another way that that protein can be overexpressed. And the HER2 pathway uh, is um, a complicated pathway. Uh, HER2 and related receptors bind to a ligand and signal to the nucleus of the cell to grow. And that's generally how growth factors work. And HER2 is one that overdrives cancer cells. And that's why blocking HER2 uh, is important in uh, people who have tumors that make uh, an excessive amount of HER2. And that is targeted with the antibody uh, Herceptin, also known as trastuzumab. Um, and uh, 
there's many newer drugs now that are available to target HER2, not just trastuzumab, but another antibody known as pertuzumab or pergetta, and other small molecule inhibitors known as kinase inhibitors, uh, lapatinib, neuratinib, and tucatinib. And again, I won't go into those details, but, but because I really want to underscore the importance of, of HER2 testing. Uh, and um, we also know that growth factors can be important in how the cell responds. mTOR is a part of the growth factor pathway that I showed you earlier, and blocking that with a drug called Everolimus can improve outcome. The, these um, curves that I'm showing you are progression-free survival curves that show you how long people go without progressing. And when the curve is higher, that means the drug is, is, is more effective. More people are going without progression. And in this case, um, it doubled the time to progression. And we need to push these PFS curves out further and further with newer drugs. And we want to see the upper curve almost be uh, a, a horizontal line. That's what we're aiming for, and we're getting there slowly. Um, and and uh, I'm going to skip this in the interest of time. I'm going to move to HER2 therapy uh, for metastatic breast cancer because um, just to briefly cover it to underscore the importance of HER2 testing. Uh, and I'm going to go straight to this trial here, which is the Cleopatra trial, which um, shows you that uh, patients on this trial that was um, done 10 years ago and we still use as first-line therapy, uh, the red curve shows how patients on um, the addition of pertuzumab do better than just with trastuzumab alone. And this is given with the first few months being given with chemotherapy and then after that just with maintenance therapy. And you can see that 10 years out, about 30% of uh, patients on this trial are still alive. Now, of course, we want to see that number even go higher, uh, but it is um, a good to know that some of these newer drugs can give us these very long disease-free survival. And, and really, ultimately, what we hope to find is that through proper selection uh, and the identification of the right treatment, uh, that we will match uh, a drug to the biology of that patient's cancer. And not only is our ability to understand the biology going to improve, but the drugs we use uh, are going to improve as well. Uh, in fact, one of the tr uh, drugs, an antibody drug conjugate known as NHER2 or trastuzumab drugs, TCAN, is giving us a much wider separation of this curve. Uh, this was a study that compared an older drug called TDM1, also known as CADSILA, to the new drug NHER2, and this has now become our second-line go-to drug because of its performance. And again, we expect these types of curves to separate more and more. Uh, DNA repair, as I mentioned, uh, can be affected by uh, people that have BRCA1 and 2 mutations, so it's very important to test for that as well. We actually have drugs that can um, augment, uh, uh, impair DNA repair so that when you already have a BRCA mutation that inhibits DNA repair and now you add another drug, you get a, um, a, an effect that's known as um, uh, uh, synthetic lethal, where the, uh, both of these conditions make the cell unable to survive, and that's why PARP inhibitors can be uh, effective and have shown improvements in outcome when added uh, or when compared to chemotherapy, as illustrated in this trial looking at the PARP inhibitor Olaparib compared to standard chemotherapy. Um, the keynote uh, study was one that looked at immunotherapy, and this was the first study that actually led to approval of immune therapy in breast cancer with a drug uh, known as pembrolizumab, also the trade name is Keytruda. And when it was compared to chemotherapy, to a when it was added to chemotherapy, it gave us improvements in disease-free survival. And again, these curves are a good sign, but we want to do better. And as we understand the immune system more, we will get there. But this is, uh, speaks to the importance of pdl one testing, specifically for patients with triple negative breast cancers. Uh, there is some early evidence that hormone receptor positive cancers, especially the more high grade ones, may also respond to immunotherapy. Uh, and it's not clear what role PDL1 will play. Um, so the story is still unfolding. It's not yet approved for hormone receptor positive, but there are some newer data that um, uh, will say that a subset of these may respond. But more importantly, the whole field of immunotherapy is rapidly evolving. Not as fast in breast cancer as it is in other cancers, but I think that as we unlock more about the immune system in breast cancer, we will get more specific drugs, maybe even specifically for breast cancer. 
So this is a summary of the genomic testing that we do and how it points to different drugs. And I won't get into all the details. This is a, a very detailed slide. And by the way, I, I hope these slides are all available to you, um, and I'm sure they are. If not, I can uh, make, make sure that, that you, you get these and, and can, can have them for your own use. Uh, but um, because I can't really go over all of these, but we can get to some of these in the question and answer. But there's a lot of mutations now that actually lead to a specific drug. And every year now, we see a couple new ones approved for different tumors. Some of them are approved for across the board. If you have, a, for example, if you have a high tumor mutational burden, that means a lot of mutations per segment of DNA. So just a, essentially a hypermutated tumor genome you will more likely respond to immunotherapy. And pembrolizumab is actually approved on a tumor agnostic basis. That means for any type of tumor that has a high mutational tumor burden. And um, uh, that is um, a, a way to get access to that drug, even though you may be one in maybe 20 people that might, might have a high TMB, uh, that you would be eligible for Keytruda, even if your pdl one is negative. And there's many other examples of drugs that we actually now can use for these. It's a small number of cases. Now, there's some mutations that are common, like PIK3CA, about 40% of people have that, and that might make them eligible for some of the drugs that I mentioned that target uh, that pathway. Uh, ESR1 mutation is another common mutation that we see. ESR1 is the gene that encodes the estrogen receptor. And it turns out that the estrogen receptor itself can be mutated so that it is active without even binding to estrogen. Now you have an activated autonomous estrogen receptor, and there are now uh, a, a new generation of drugs that can affect that. This is the first one to be approved specifically for ESR1 mutations, a drug called Elasisgrant that showed uh, an improvement, as you can see, specifically even more so in patients whose tumors carried the ESR1 mutation. Uh, they tested both the non-mutated and mutated uh, version. So um, that gives you a snapshot as to why and how we do genetic testing. The key things to remember is that everybody with metastatic cancer at some point should have an initial biopsy to establish the diagnosis, make sure it's not a different cancer, know what the receptors are so we choose the right treatment, and to get sequencing. We can get sequencing not only from the tumor, but nowadays we can also get it from the blood with what's known as a liquid biopsy, where the same DNA that you measure from a tumor biopsy that's making its way into the blood, it's shed into the blood, can now be picked up and detected and amplified. Uh, and this is probably going to be the technology of the future, because we can get so, such um, high amount of information from the blood that we probably won't even need to do tumor biopsies for genomics, but we'll still need to do it for receptor. And then germline testing, uh, and that rounds things out for personalizing um, your, your uh, treatment decisions. So thank you for your attention. It's, I know it's a complicated um, topic to cover, but we'll have a chance to, uh, to take some questions. Uh, and thanks to LLBC for putting this on. By the way, that last um, picture was my mother's art. She's an artist that lives in New Orleans. And uh, I want to give her a credit. That's amazing. Whoa. OK, is the mic working? That was an incredible presentation. <laughs> Everybody, the slides will be available. So I know a lot of you are asking that question. Um, and we are going to do our best to just wrap it, you know, go through these as many questions as we can. We probably won't get to all of them, but we will do our best. I just want to start by sort of combining a few questions together because obviously we have people here in the room as well as watching who are coming from all over the country, not necessarily at an academic center. So there are a couple questions. Can any doctor get these tests? You know, are they available regardless as to where you are? So let's start with that one. Yes, these tests are broadly available. Uh, typically what it requires is, is that the pathologist identify a biopsy that is optimal. They actually have to look at the slides to make sure it contains enough tumor. And then they send that slide to, to the company where um, it's subjected to a multiplication of the DNA and sequencing. There are numerous companies that do this now. There's probably a dozen companies, uh, and it's rapidly growing. Uh, and usually the turnaround time for the test is about one to two weeks. It's going to get quicker. 
Uh, and so um, uh, it, it is very widely available. And uh, again, they're send out tests, the pathology departments know how to, how to do this and process it. I would say that maybe at very small hospitals it might be more challenging to do that or in practices that are in rural areas and don't have access to it. But increasingly, um, the companies that do the testing are making sure that um, the people that help coordinate this can be available to all oncologists. It's very important to ask though. You, you never, and it's uh, unfortunate that our patients have to be guardrails, but, but they are. And I must say, even, even for me, I'm gonna see if maybe I can move this down. I already messed up my mic, so. <laughs> um, so can, can you, well, of course, you may not be able to hear me, Lee. Uh, so uh, uh, it's very important that, um, I, it just as a general uh, issue, that our patients ask questions and ask why isn't this being done? Why? It, it, you would be amazed at how many times that triggers something. We're all humans, and even I will get some cues from my patients that, oh, here's something I need to explain better. Or maybe they're right. I didn't think they, this test might help, but now that I think about it, it's possible that it may. Let's cover that base. So it is very important to have a dialogue, and you know, an honest dialogue. You're not putting your oncologist down by questioning them. You're, you're, you're just really clarifying it for yourself, and even though they may not admit it, sometimes you are influencing their behavior. It really is teamwork. And um, I think patients that are communicative um, are uh, really to be congratulated. And we have to, that's one thing our, pra our profession has to do is make sure physicians are listening, make sure that they are considering that a positive thing to be asked a question or to be asked why this is not being done. But it is absolutely essential that um, anyone with metastatic breast cancer has their tumor sequence. Maybe not right at initial diagnosis, because many of our first-line therapies don't require that information, uh, but more and more in the future they will. And it's good to have at the beginning, because when people are having progression of their cancer, sometimes it's progression that needs to be treated more quickly, and you want to have that information ahead of time and Great. sort of have a roadmap already laid out. Right, so it's important to ask yes, and, and ask at each progression, does it make yes. sense to test again? So Tony and Chazine are gonna help with sort through the questions. I just wanted to remind everyone, the second speaker will be talking about medical advances, so we're really gonna not go into those questions, not that Dr. Tripathi couldn't answer them. So Tony, do you wanna get the next question? Yes, the first question from the audience is a two-part question. Is a blood biopsy sufficient to detect mutations and how frequently should we retest or biopsy, um, especially when progression occurs? A blood test is generally uh, sufficient to get uh, the mutational profile, especially with some of the more sensitive assays, uh, but still not fully. And so for certain mutations, it is recommended that if, uh, especially for PIK3CA, which is a common mutation, uh, but one that may not be seen in the blood because you happen to be testing the patient at a time when their tumor burden is low. And all tumors don't secrete DNA into the blood as the same as others. So there are situations where if the liquid biopsy is negative and there is a biopsy available or you get a new biopsy, that it should be sent for confirmation for certain genes. I can go unless... Okay. Um, so there's, there's several questions about um, the, the timing of testing, which you, which you did address. Sorry, I'm seeing so many come on. Although um, while you're, well, uh, yeah. there, the, part of the, the other part of that question was, should it be tested at every time, which sort of goes to that question of timing. And um, maybe not necessarily, it really depends on the situation. For example, if I have someone on HER2 therapy, anti-HER2 therapy, and they're recurring in one area, like a new area in the liver, or, or an area that was existing but is growing, but all the other areas aren't, I'm actually going to biopsy that area, because it may be different. I've mentioned clonal selection. Uh, and one of the things I'm going to see is, is it still positive for HER2? So that, in that situation, I'm going to test, make sure I have HER2, ER, PR, but I'm also going to get gene sequencing. Uh, because of the situation. So generally speaking, you may not need all of this with every progression, but in certain cases, it is helpful. So again, that's why the nuances are so important. Okay, I found my question. Thank you. <laughs> um, this question is interesting. Is, 
Is any progression due to resistance? And the second part, are all resistances due to a mutation? So the answer is uh, usually um, progression is due to resistance if you're on treatment. Uh, and uh, otherwise, you, you would still have uh, some control of the cancer, but not always. There may be mutations that cause the cell to simply grow more rapidly uh, independent of the drug. In other words, uh, the, the drug might sort of be keeping it in check and it's growing very slowly and now a new mutation just increases its growth rate. But usually it is due, due to resistance. Not all mechanisms of drug resistance are due to a mutation. There are changes in tumor behavior where the DNA sequence doesn't change. You silence one of the genes, so that's called uh, epigenetic modulation of a tumor, where it's not due to an actual base pair change, but it's due to a gene being silenced. So um, there are other adaptive processes that do not involve DNA, and that is sort of a dark area for us. It's an area that we need to learn more about, epigenetics, other adaptive. And as we get more sophisticated protein analysis with things like mass spectroscopy, we're gonna be able to look not only at the genome, but what we call the proteome and the transcriptome, which is RNA. So those are the three different levels of control of the cell, some of which we aren't yet looking at. Right, so along the same lines, um, can you develop a PIK3CA mutation and or an ESR1 mutation? Yeah, that, that's a great example. Some, um, a great question. Some uh, genetic lesions are what we call acquired, whereas others are, are known as truncal. They're there from the beginning. PIK3CA tends to be a truncal mutation. You, you see it at the beginning. If you biopsy the early stage tumor, it's probably going to be the same as a metastasis. ESR1 is an acquired mutation, and it's not truly acquired. There's probably such a small percentage of the original tumors that are ESR1 mutant that you, you can't, can't detect it, but because those are the ones that survive, they get enriched for, and then they look as though they're acquired. So ESR1 mutations at diagnosis of initial cancer is very rare, less than 1%. But in patients, particularly on estrogen deprivation theory, things at lower estrogen level, like aromatase inhibitors, patients that are on that for a long time, either in the adjuvant setting for early stage or a long time for metastatic disease, they're the ones that have a higher chance of having an ESR1 mutation. Tony, or Tracy? Yeah. Um, along those lines, um, trying to keep this question general, sorry. Um, can you elaborate on a situation where there are no biomarkers, no circulating tumor cells, but there is a progression? Yes, there are situations where uh, certain cancers grow in sort of a stealth mode and they don't shed their DNA. So if you look at patients that may have even similar looking scans, uh, you may find different levels of tumor DNA because the act of the DNA being released by the cell is also governed by a lot of biological processes that may vary from one person to another. So there are some of those variables. Certain histologies are also associated with lower uh, tumor mutational rates, like lobular cancers start with low tumor mutation rates, but then over the course of treatment, they actually can evolve to become more hypermutated, so they behave a little bit differently. Uh, so um, th th it really varies from tumor to tumor. And we're not perfect at detecting. We're not there yet, but we're going to get better and better as the technology improves. There's some questions about imaging, so I thought maybe we'll move away from biomarkers. Um, sure. What advantage does a PET scan offer versus a full body scan combined, combined with a CT, CT torso scan? So this is a really good question because we as clinicians often struggle. What is the best testing to obtain? Sometimes insurance companies won't approve a PET CT if you haven't done a CT scan first, which I think is wrong, but in a way reflects a little bit of our ignorance in knowing who should get what. In general, the more rapidly proliferating tumors like triple negative cancers or even some of the hormone receptor positive cancers but the ones that are high grade, those show up better on a PET CT scan because the metabolic activity is higher. So it helps us um, a little bit more. Most other cancers I would say that a combination of a CT scan with iodine contrast and a bone scan can together give you a pretty accurate picture. So I'm glad you mentioned insurance companies. I'm sure a number of you have had Scans denied, and so what's your advice? I know doctors play a big role in advocating, but sort of what do, what do you do if it's denied? And 
Well, many times there's what's called a peer-to-peer -peer review where you have an opportunity to talk to a medical director that is responsible for sort of being the gatekeeper and explaining to them why you want to get it. Uh, sometimes they will make you do the regular scan and, and, and sh uh, show you that the results in the liver are equivocal and need further definition. And then you can either get an MRI or maybe a PET CT scan. And it's really designed to help insurance companies manage maybe the doctors not being as selective, but it's also a barrier. And so we have to bridge the gap and it, it basically takes additional communication with the medical director. I have spent in some cases hours on the phone Sorry. trying to dis discuss a case and getting them to overturn it. And um, so uh, it, uh, uh, it, it's really a matter of making sure that you justify it. And it's best if you do it ahead of time. When you send the request and say exactly why you're ordering it, do it ahead of time so that they, they will approve it. And, so, and you have to code it right. All the diagnostic codes have to be in there so that they know that the patient has metastatic disease and so on and so forth. Yeah. So just another call, if you're not happy with your medical oncologist, you need to find someone who will really advocate for you because clearly they are out there. Um, go ahead, Tony. But along those same lines, are the insurance companies starting to cover the genetic testing um, more? Uh, because I know that was a problem before. And then also, um, are, are these tests going to be more mainstream because often doctors don't know what to do with the results of the test? Yeah, so generally uh, insurance companies are now covering genomic testing for someone who has metastatic uh, uh, cancer uh, of any type. Uh, so it's really a matter of being proactive. Um, it also helps if the doctors are more willing to engage with uh, the representative of the different companies. A lot of doctors just don't like drug reps and pharmaceutical reps, and I, I think that's probably gone too far because they can actually tell you how to get access to their technology and to their drugs and um, to work collaboratively with the practices so they know how to navigate the system. So yes, it is covered, uh, increasingly so, uh, and Medicare covers it, and um, really it just has to be, again, the diagnostic codes have to be right. So there's a couple of questions about defining somatic mutations and germline. I know you did that, but can you Right. It's a complicated one. <laughs> right. Germline mutations are the genes that you uh, pass on to your children. And so it's the same copy of the DNA that you have from a direct blood relative, or you have a 50-50 chance of having it. And so inherited mutations uh, like BRCA1 and 2 are passed on, and they, they not only affect your risk of cancer, but if you have cancer, they affect your biology. Acquired mutations are mutations that you did not have when you were born and that other cells in your body that are normal cells, like blood cells, do not have, but only the tumor has it. So we call those somatic mutations, because somatic means um, a cell of the body that is not um, the germline cell, like the egg and the sperm. So those are acquired, and that's where most of the tumor mutations are, really. Of all patients with breast cancer, probably 5% of them have an inherited mutation, but everyone has some mutation in their tumor. Uh, there is a mutation somewhere. It may not be an informative mutation, but, but definitely there's a lot of mutations in any cancer. And even in cells that are precancerous, we can see them too. Interesting. Go ahead. Um, what is the estimated precision of a liquid biopsy test? Th that's a hard question to answer because it really depends on how much tumor there is. In someone that has very low burden of tumor, let's say they have a solitary lung metastasis, it it's going to be a lower chance of picking it up. So that may not be the ideal person to count on a liquid biopsy. And if I have someone with a small solitary tumor, I'm actually going to biopsy and send that rather than count on a liquid biopsy. Okay. There's a, I think this is an important question to address. Um, so this is a person who was tested for the BRCA mutation and I assume a full panel and has an unknown variant. It doesn't have, doesn't have anything actionable. But she does have a daughter. So mm -hmm. what age are you recommending um, for daughters or sons to be tested, whether there's a known mutation or not for genetics. Right, well, we always want to start with knowing who has a genetic mutation rather than screening the general population. So if you have uh, ca uh, breast cancer and you have had germline sequencing and it's negative, um, your children really are not gonna have that risk. 
Variants of unknown significance have always been challenging because what, th what that is is that the, the gene sequence is not normal. So it, there is a, 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 a mutation. But we don't know if it's a normal variant because there are some changes in our DNA that some of us have where we only have a minority of that sequence. But it is seen in other people and it doesn't affect the, pro the function of the protein. So we call those normal variants that, that, that uh, don't uh, cause a disease state. So that's always hard to, to know. And when we first started doing genetic testing, we were really selective because we didn't want to find a, v a variant that we didn't know of that it was a real mutation. But over the years, we've assembled these very large familial cohorts. Some of you may have participated in some of these studies where we now were able to link, did that mutation track with someone that actually got cancer? And by studying large families, the, the variants of unknown significance now have become, we have more confidence that they're normal and we actually treat them as normal, but we always track them because they could be reclassified later as we get more information. I, and I think that was the main question. Yeah. Right? Yeah. The variance okay. of unknown significance. Are you? Do you have a question? Well, we do have an imaging question. There's a question about. Um, can you talk a little bit about the new PET FES scan that's available? Yes. Yeah. So the way PET scans work is that you use a radio, a slightly radioactive material that that binds to some aspect, some protein in the body, uh, and can be seen on a scan. The standard FDG PET, which stands for fluorodeoxyglucose, is looking at metabolic activity, which is higher in a cancer cell. So that's what the normal PET scan is looking at, metabolic activity. FES is looking at the estrogen receptor. It's fluoroestradiol. So it's actually estrogen that binds the estrogen receptor, and it's labeled with um, a, a, a radionuclide of fluorine that, that uh, allows the detector to pick it up. So for patients who have estrogen receptor positive tumors, it may be a more accurate way to detect it. Estrogen receptor positive tumors sometimes have a slower growth rate. They, they tend to have a slower growth rate. So they're not as metabolically active and might be missed on a conventional PET scan. So that's why the FES test is, is uh, uh, helpful, is in patients who have estrogen, we know they have an estrogen receptor positive tumor, we may be able to use those with more clarity. We still need a little more data to know who to get it in, but I am starting to now get it in certain patients where imaging is difficult, like lobular cancers. That, that are ER positive. That's one area where we're using it. And you can't be on a drug that degrades the estrogen receptor like Fazlidex, otherwise it won't work. So, but uh, aromatase inhibitors, that, that's fine. And so um, we're going to be seeing more of these PET reagents, not just fluoroestradiol, but there's one that's called PSMA PET, which is used in prostate cancer, and we're seeing that we, it might be helpful in breast cancer. So there's gonna be some new advances in nuclear medicine imaging as time goes on. If a patient is still on their first line of treatment and has not had progression and had proper testing at the time of diagnosis, what additional testing, if any, would be recommended? So in someone who's getting first line therapy and their scans are stable, um, we sometimes will also check serum markers, which are protein markers. They're not as specific. In other words, they can sometimes drift up for no reason at all and the scans are stable. So we're still learning how to use that a little bit better. Uh, but what's emerging as a new technology now, it's not that new, but as I had mentioned earlier, is circulating tumor DNA where we can actually quantify it. So that may become another technology that, that even may at some point totally replace imaging. But if, if, um, uh, if we're having a hard time looking at it by scan, some tumors just don't show well on scans. This is a technology that is still being developed for that purpose, but might be a, a supplemental way to track the amount of tumor. Great. So I, I'm being told we only have time for one more question. So I'm going to ask something and generalize it. But there is someone who's saying that she's HER2 positive and she's um, been doing well for six years. So she wants to know how can she contribute. And then I thought that might be just a good way for you maybe to talk about the importance of clinical trials. Yeah, so uh, people with HER2 positive cancers can have stable disease for a very long time. I've been fortunate enough to just talk to several people here. And so as long as the scans are stable and you're clinically doing well and tolerating your treatment well, um, really we, we do continue on, uh, recommend continuing ongoing monitoring and ongoing treatment, although we don't have a lot of data if someone maybe can stop and do well. We, we, we simply don't know. It may be that some of the two circulating tumor DNA tests may help us do this in, in the future. 
future, as you mentioned, we need clinical trials uh, to do this. But as long as you're stable and tolerating your therapy, I recommend continue scanning unless your doctor gives you a reason why they, they, they don't think it's, it's necessary. And we also recommend staying on treatment, but admittedly, we don't know for how long that should be. Right, and I know Dana-Farber does have a, st a stop, have um, her two, stop Herceptin trial, and right. we do know some people on that trial who have been doing well for eight months, so mm -hmm. it's amazing to see that happening.